for those of you who don't know me, I'm Dr. Joseph Soa. I'm a composer and a composition teacher. I run a program called the Wizarding School for Composers. Uh, some of you have been in it, many of you it's new. Today, we are uh, sharing with you a presentation uh, called Getting Started with Yoriko. So this is a workshop, the goal of which is to help many of you who are transitioning from Finale know how to use Dorico. For those of you who are just curious about Dorico and we're using Sibelius or MuseScore or something else, um, this will also be an opportunity to speed and find out more about uh, find out more about the program and ask some questions. So it's great to have you all today, and I want to start just by uh, just by covering a few really basic things. First up. <clears throat> you should have received in email this document right here. I'm about to share my screen with this document right here. I'm going to put this in the chat so that you can, um, so that you can download it and you can have it. So I've just added that to the chat. And what this document goes over, this is kind of like, all of the basics that I suggest that if you're wanting to learn Dorico, uh, these are things that I would suggest that you should know. It covers just the very basics of how to get started, references to keep at hand, important tutorials, uh, support forums, and you know if you want some help from me, how you can get that. So I think the fastest way to learn Dorico is just copying something. And so if you have, if you need something to copy, here are some ideas. If you have something to copy, just go ahead and copy it. I think that that's the fastest way to learn the program. Um, a couple of other things that I will point out as that we're going to be talking about and things that you should uh, be aware of. These are several references that you should have handy. Uh, let me change my screen share so that you can see all of them all at once. So there is, um, you're going to find out more in about 20 minutes all about popovers. Um, and so this handout will be uh, more useful. But there is a list of all these different, uh, there's a list of all these different things that you can type into Dorico's popovers. And this is so useful to have. Um, Yes, Hugh, if you have Dorico 4, this is still going to be relevant to that. Some of the popovers will be a little bit different, but it's like 90% the same. Likewise, um, you have this whole list of different tokens that you can use in Dorico. And again, popovers, tokens, all of these things, it may sound like gibberish right now, but it will make sense. The point of what I'm just trying to show you is that I have all of these things on this PDF. Um, that are going to be useful for you as you're going on your Dorico journey. The last thing I want to point out on this PDF that would be helpful for you is this one right here, switching from Finale to Dorico. Dorico put together a series of videos that to help users who are switching from Finale to Dorico. If you just click on that, it will pop open. Um, these videos cover a variety of topics, including how to install Dorico, why switch to Dorico, things about node input, importing music XML. These videos are really excellent. Um, I'm going to cover some things that are in these videos and some things and probably many things that aren't in these videos. But if you haven't watched them yet, I would encourage you to watch these videos. Out of curiosity, just put a Y or a one in chat if you have seen these videos and if you've watched them. And then put a two or a no in chat if you haven't seen them. OK, so it's kind of a mix. And it looks like I'm just watching it stream in, and it looks kind of like 50-50-ish. So yeah, if you haven't watched these yet, I would encourage you to watch them. The fastest way to find them is just on this handout. Uh, that's just on this handout that I gave you. So. That is all about the handout. One last thing that I'm going to mention uh, before we move on to uh, diving into the program. 
if you want to have some, if you want to like dive a little bit deeper with me and are, aren't yet uh, in a way that is, um, you know, just to help, let me try it again. As part of the workshop, what I've done is I've opened up some times in my calendar for like a 15 minute like Dorico migration audit call. This call is completely free. So if you'd like some help just looking over your specific needs, you're welcome to come in here onto Calendly. I have a limited number of slots available, but you're welcome to come in here on Calendly, select a slot, choose a particular time, say 2 p.m. on Friday, um, this is 2 p.m. Eastern, just click next and then fill out all the details here. This would be particularly helpful if you're doing very unique things, like let's say that you're working with a lot of proportional notation or other uh, unusual situations. Uh, go ahead and do that. This will give us an opportunity to chat with a little bit more, um, chat in a little bit more depth. Um, there is going to be at least a 30 minute Q&A period at the end of this call today, but if you don't get your question in, this is a great opportunity to uh, chat with me and, and get some one-on-one -on -one time about whatever your questions are about Dorico. So to review, we've talked about the getting started guide. We've talked about you know, some references that you should have on hand. And I've shown you these videos that at least half of you should go ahead and watch. Where we are going for the next hour, so the first thing that we're going to do for the next hour is we're going to um, just talk about setting up a score, uh, just all of the basics of how do you set up a score, how do you enter pitches, how do you enter dynamics, all of that basic sort of stuff. We're going to spend about an hour or so, give or take, doing that. Next, we're going to talk about uh, importing your files from Finale or any notation program into Dorico using Music XML. We're gonna spend about 20 to 30 minutes talking about that and what you can expect when you're importing files. Last but not least, I've reserved about a half an hour at the end of the session where we can just simply do questions and answers because uh, many of you have sent in questions beforehand and I'm sure that others of you will, if you didn't have questions before the session, you will have questions. So that will be an opportunity um, for you to ask those questions there. Now, the thing that I will say is that, again, there are currently 66 people in this room besides me. If I don't notice your question in chat, it's not because I'm trying to snub you, it's because there are 66 other people and I can't necessarily keep track of all of you. So again, if you have a question, please, uh, and you wanna get my attention, your best bet is to raise a Zoom hand. The way that you do that, if you're on a Mac, is you just do Option Y. If you're on a PC, Alt Y should do the same thing. This is, the, this is the keyboard shortcut, and then that will get my attention. Yeah, George raised his hand. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so if you want to get my attention, that's the best way to do it. So without further ado, uh, let's get started. So. When you open up Dorico, um, the very first thing that you will see is something that looks like this. As you'll see this Steinberg hub, and it will give you the option to open any sort of recent file. Uh, you can create a new file and then you'll have this learn category. Learn category is very useful. There are more tutorials that happens here. This videos is just essentially a feed of whatever it is on their YouTube channel. So that's why some of these are in German and some of these are in English because they publish both kinds of videos in YouTube. These hands-on tutorials are also really great, um, very useful in terms of getting started. And then I would also point out the direct link to the forum and the manual is this is an excellent place to get all of your questions answered. And Dorico actually has a really good manual to answer a bunch of other questions as well. So you can find all of those things uh, just here on the hub. Um, but what we wanna do today is we wanna create a new file. Now, when you're creating a new file in Dorico, you can choose uh, any particular template that you want, or you can just start off from an empty project. So we're gonna just start from an empty project just because I have a few things that I wanna show you. Um, you can put in the project title here. Uh, let's call this Symphony just because, and you can put in your name. 
you can change all of these things here in terms of page size and rastral size and like the music fonts and text fonts and all these sorts of things, or you can leave them off and you can create them when you're in the project. It really doesn't matter. This just sort of like can skip some steps for you. For instance, if you know that your piece is going to be in 3-4 and that it's going to be in E flat, you can just get that set up ahead of time. But if you don't know, you can just uncheck these and uh, put them in as you wish. Now, because I know where I'm heading with this, um, I'm going to change the page size over to tabloid. And we're just going to hit Create Project. So when you see this, you're going to look, think to yourself, gee, Joseph just said he is making this a tabloid size thing. Why isn't there any sort of paper here, right? What's the deal with that? And this is one of the uh, big philosophical differences between Dorico and certainly Finale, but also the other programs, is that Dorico makes a distinction between staves and players. Is that, for instance, typically like in an orchestral score, like your third piccolo is, your third flute is also going to be doubling on piccolo. And so you're going to want to be able to switch back and forth between a piccolo staff and a, you're going to be able to want to switch back and forth between your piccolo staff and a flute staff. And so Dorico makes it very easy and natural to do that without having to resort to staff styles. Um, so let me show you, if we were to put together a basic orchestration, how it is that we could do that. So you have this really, you have these buttons down here at the bottom, which are the exact same thing as what is popping up over here. So you have individual players, section players, and ensembles. An individual player is literally an individual. A section player is a group of players. So for instance, the violin one section. And then the ensemble is just sort of a fast way to add a bunch of players all at once. So if we knew that we wanted to say, have a solo ocarina player, we could just go in, add a solo player, add a solo ocarina, and then there's our ocarina right there. But let's say that we wanted to have an orchestra to back up this ocarina. What we could do is we could come into the ensemble and we can either choose from various ensembles that Dorico has pre-programmed out of the box, or we could just start typing stuff in. So we could say that we want a double woodwind, and then maybe we want two trumpets, two horns, um, timpani, and string, uh, let's let's just take it from there. We're going to add all of those instruments, and then it will add all of them. You'll notice that Dorico, even though I did trumpets before the horns, it automatically put it in orchestral score order for us, which is great. Now let's say that we want to add. Was there a question? Okay. Let's say that we want to add uh, the string section, and maybe let's even add a choir too. So we're going to add, come up back up here to the thing. We're going to just type in string section. Really easy. Click add. It's going to put it in the appropriate place. Likewise, we can go in here and we can just add S. We can just start typing SATB choir. Uh, or I could have just started typing choir. And all of these different options would all pop up. So and again. Dorico knows where the standard locations for these different things are, and it will put them uh, over in the standard locations for them. One last thing I'm going to add to this uh, for reasons that will be clear in the future is I'm just going to add a piano. All right. So here we've now made our basic score. And like I said, Dorico makes this distinction between uh, staves and players. So let's say that we want our flute two player to have a piccolo. We can come over here into the flute two and we'll just hit this little plus button and we can give the flute two player a piccolo. Just hit add. And then now this flute two player, if you click the little drop down thing right there, see so you see flute two, piccolo. Let's say that we've decided that the ocarina isn't going to be done by a solo player, but the flute one is going to play that ocarina. What we can do is we can just take this ocarina thing and we can drag it over to flute one. And now flute one is playing the ocarina. I just want to show you really quickly, we're going to get a little bit more into the right mode stuff later. Um, but I just want to show you what this looks like. So in right mode, you can see it, you can see the score in two different ways. 
uh, in write mode, you can view it as page view, which is showing you this is what it's going to look like on the piece of paper. You can also view it in galley view, which is these are all of the staves that are happening behind the scenes. So if I were to uh, if I were to write some notes into the flute, into flute one, and then switch over to ocarina, what would happen in the what would happen in the score is that you see that Dorico is automatically switching us to the ocarina right there. And it looks like my ocarina notes are out of range, so I can just move them so that they're into range. This is going to make a little bit more sense uh, in a moment, but I just want to show you the basics of how it is that this works. Um, we're going to come back to setup mode uh, as we talk a little bit more about page formatting and other sorts of fancy things that we can uh, fancy things that we can do in. Uh, Sorry play. to interrupt. Can you can you show I'm can you show that one more time how you switched between the instruments? How I switched between the instruments? Yeah. So over in write mode, uh, you're going to come up to view, and this is either page view or galley view. Yeah, and you know, thank you for interrupting. And if if you have, I mean, obviously we can't have fifteen people interrupting at the same time. But if you have a question, please ask. That will make it easier for me to know what it is that you need. Um, one of the things that I part of how it is that I was able to do that so fast was because of the keyboard shortcuts. This is another design philosophy thing in Dorico. Dorico is meant to be interacted with primarily using the keyboard because you can put stuff into the into Dorico faster if you're using the keyboard rather than if you're pointing and clicking with a mouse. Uh, the keyboard shortcuts when you're on the when you're here in the menu, some of you know this, but I imagine that some of you don't, is if you look over on the right hand side of the menu, you'll see these little uh, combinations of symbols. And these are just telling you, uh, these are just telling you whatever the keyboard shortcut is for any particular function. Is that helpful? I wasn't sure who was, who was asking. Yeah, no, I, I lost track of what you did when you switched from flute one to ocarina on your input. Yeah, so, so here's flute one, here's ocarina. So this is, we're in the galley view, right? Um, we're gonna talk a little bit more about node input right now. So uh, maybe uh, like, that thought, Michael, and we'll come back to it. Cool. So, um, this is, again, basic setup view, and I'm going to just throw out these notes because I want to show you some, uh, I want to show you some basic stuff when we're over in write mode. So if we're in write mode, you're typically going to be confronted with something that looks like this, where you see we just have a big, uh, we just have this big series of empty rests. Now, from Dorico's perspective, Dor from Dorco's perspective, it's not going to assume that uh, Dorco is not coming from the perspective of there's a time signature unless you tell it there's a time signature. So unless you tell Dorco that there's a time signature, it's very naturally just going to be chugging along in open meter. And so this is great news for any of you who want to write uh, in, open in open meter music or in proportional notation because Dorico is the program that is best for doing open meter kinds of things because it's you don't have to do any sort of jank, anything janky to make it do that. It just does open meter right out of the box. But let's say we didn't want open meter because you know most music isn't. Um, you have, when you're in write mode, you have these panels that are all along the side of, uh, that are along the side of the window. I mean, you see it actually in all of the modes. In all of the modes, you typically have a left panel, a right panel, and then if I were to make this a little bit uh, bigger down there, you have that bottom panel as well. So left, right, I can make this bigger. There's the bottom panel. Oftentimes, I close these down. You can just, there's that little carrot that's right there. You can just click it to open it or close it, and those panels will pop up. Now, when you're in write mode and you're trying to put notes in, um, let me, again, let me show you what you're looking at with the panels. Over on this side in the left panel, this is the panel that has to do ev with everything in terms of, uh, everything in terms of inter inputting pitches and rhythms. So this, is, this is your pitches and rhythms panel. Meanwhile, over on the right side, 
this is your everything that is not a pitch and rhythm panel. So we have clefs, key signatures, time signatures, tempo, so on and so forth. Uh, let's start by putting in a, uh, let's start by putting in a meter and then we'll talk about some node entry stuff. So again, if I want to put in a, if I want to put in a time signature, I can go over here and click on the little three, four thing and it will show me a bunch of common time signatures, but I can also create my own. So let's say I really did want this in three, four. I could just click on that first note there, click on three, four, and then boom, all of a sudden, all of this is rewritten in three, four, and we have all of the, uh, we have all of the um, uh, bar lines that are automatically put in. One of the consequences of Dorico being bar line agnostic is that it will take your music and it will re-notate it for whatever meter it is that you're in. So three, four, of course, is a simple triple meter, which means that, again, most of you know this, that we have three beats and the chord note gets the beat. Six, eight has the same durate, has the same ultimate value, the same way that a, a meter, a bar of three, four, it sums up to a dotted half note, a bar of six, eight sums up to a dotted half note. I mean, again, there are some people who are a little bit less experienced, most of you know this, but I'm explaining this just because Dorico is naturally going to uh, connect the notes, uh, Dorico is naturally going to draw the notes in ways that make sense in three, four, but if I were to switch this to three, eight, what you'll see is that Dorico automatically, without me touching a thing, rewrote the notes such that they fit 6-8. This can get really kind of silly. So for instance, if I were to write this into 15-16, uh, Dorico will rewrite this such that it makes sense in 15-16. Um, and you don't have to do a blessed thing. So honestly, this is one of my favorite party tricks of Dorico. And as someone who writes a lot of music where the meter changes a lot, it's very helpful for me. Um, so we can just toggle back to three, four, and then now we're, now we're back in business with three, four. Let's say that we would, would uh, want to put in a key signature. Um, we can again, do that over here. Here are all of our key signatures. Uh, we can go in just you know, typical circle of fifths kinds of stuff. Um, if you want to add some sort of custom key signatures, Dorico has the option to do that too. Uh, not in this, there's a little bit more that you need to do in order to do that, um, but we can go from there. So let's just say that we want this in, uh, sure, we'll say that we want this in G. We can just click that in, we're good to go. Again, Dorico automatically uh, puts in all of the accidentals. This is another difference between uh, this is another difference between uh, Dorico and Finale, is that in Finale, if you were to change the key signature, it would transpose it for you. Dorico doesn't do that. It just leaves the pitches exactly where it is. If you wanted to transpose things in Dorico, there is a function for that. You can just go up here to uh, write, transpose, and you can just transpose things however it is that you want. So. I'm going to pause here right now for questions. I see some questions in the chat, and I'm going to just address those really quickly. So is there an easy setting to tell it whether 5-4 is 2 plus 3 or 3 plus 2? Yeah, um, that is a thing that you can do. There are a couple of different ways of, uh, there are a couple of different ways of, of doing that and making that happen. So for instance, if we're here in 5-4, you have different ways of, uh, you have different ways of showing the meter. You can show it as regular, you can show it as additive, you can show this other things. If you're to just type two plus, um, if you're to, come on, thing. Here, I will show you how to do this using the popovers. So in addition to all of the, uh, in addition to all of the, uh, all of these little panels right here, the way that Dorico really wants you to interact with it is with these popovers. And so what a popover is, is it's a menu that, you know, there are different keyboard shortcuts. So for instance, with time signatures, it's shift M for meter, right? It's a little menu that pops up that you can just type in commands to Dorico and it will do what it is that you want. So let's say for instance, that I wanted two plus three, uh, 
over four to get my five, four, right? I could just enter that in right there. And now we have two plus three plus is over four. And that's going to group things like that. Now, let's say I don't want the pluses in there. I can come over here and I can down here in the properties panel, you'll see that there's this little thing that's checked that has the numerator style. So right now it's showing me the beat group. It's showing that it's two plus three. If I uncheck that, it's gonna go back to just five plus four. Uh, Gordon, does that answer your question? Um, yes, thank you. Excellent, great. Um, uh, Hugh, that also seems like is your uh, that also seems like is your question as well. Ray asks, can you easily change from three four to nine eight by adding dotted notes? Yeah, so let's change this back to let's change this back to three four, and I'll show you how to do that. So if we wanted to change this into 9.8, the first thing that we'd have to do is we'd have to transform these notes such that they're dotted. If I were to just dot these notes as it is, you'll see that Dorico just tries to interpret that the best, it's, the best it can by dotting uh, some of the notes and turning some of the notes into eighth notes. If you turn on insert mode, which is right here, the other way that you can get to it is with the letter I. So if you turn on insert mode, this means that instead of overwriting what's already there, um, it's going to expand the music to fill in what needs to be there. And so now if I press the dot, it expands the music to fill in what needs to be there. Now if I hit 9.8, now we have this notated in 9.8. So uh, yes, Martin, we can do staves in 9.8 over others in 3.4. Uh, we will get to that maybe in the Q&A section. Uh, and then Bill, and to answer your question, why is there an F natural in, in G major? It's because when I first entered it, I entered it as an F natural. And so when I put in the key signature, it preserved the, it preserved the accidental. Uh, Christos, yeah, you can have 3.8 and 5.8 at the same time. Again, that will be more of a Q&A thing. We won't get into that right now. So let's go back to some, uh, let's go back to some more simple things. So let's say that we have this score set up how it is that we wanted. Uh, we have, we're in G major, we're in three, four, and hypothetically, we know that we want, uh, let's say that we want uh, this score to be 16 bars long. So we already have four bars. Uh, we already have four bars that are here. Um, we could, again, click over here on bars and bar lines and just tell it that, hey, we need another 11 bars, and we could insert those at the end. Or we could do the popover, which is shift plus B. Shift plus B will bring that up. And then we can just type in that number of bars that we want. And it will also insert that for us. So in terms of note entry, Dorico has both ways that Finale does it. If you want to do pitch before duration, like uh, if you want to do pitch before duration, like speedy entry, you can do that. And the way that you do that is you uh, is that you toggle this little thing right here where it's pitch before duration. You can also get to that by typing the letter K. And so now I can, uh, you know, play in some pitches. Like maybe I want, um, it's, uh, like maybe I want a C. And then I will tell it that I want that to be a quarter note. And then maybe I want E flat, and then I'll tell it that I want that to be an eighth note. And so you can just um, you can just go on, you know, as you would in speedy entry. You can also do it the same way that you would in simple entry. Is that if you wanted to write in you write in the pitches um, after the duration, you would untoggle that thing, which is normally not toggled. And then you have whatever duration is shown over here, that's what it is that you're going to get. And so I can just play stuff in and I'm just gonna get, keep on getting quarter notes until I tell Dorico that I want something different than a quarter note. Uh, same with everything else. The design philosophy of this is, uh, is, is primary to be computer keyboard first. If you hover your mouse over this, you'll see in blue a little number. That number is telling you what, uh, what number it is on the top of your keyboard. So these numbers that are above the QWERTY keyboard 
are the numbers that are associated with putting in uh, with putting in note values. In Dorico, a quarter in Dorico, a quarter note is a six. Um, every program does that differently. That's just Dorico. If you want to reprogram what numbers are going along with what notes, you can reprogram every single key command in Dorico. Uh, we can talk about that a little bit later, but you don't have to. Uh, okay, so a couple again, a couple of ways that you can put in notes is so you can put it in either pitch first or you can put it in uh, you can put it in rhythm first. Either way is perfectly fine. You can also live record up here to a click track. The quantization is decent. I don't personally ever really uh, live record to a click myself, but if this is a thing that you want to do, you can do that in Dorico. Now, as far as putting in pitches goes, there you have several different options for this. Option number one is you can type in pitches using a MIDI keyboard. You can't see it right now, but that's what I'm doing. Option number two is you can type in letter names using the computer keyboard. That's you know what I'm doing now, just, just simple letter names. And then option number three, which is one of my favorite options, is that if you do have a MIDI keyboard, um, you can actually select multiple staves to enter stuff in. So this little carrot is showing you where I'm entering stuff. And I'm using the arrow keys to move that carrot around and to locate it on the rhythmic grid. So let's say that I wanted to have a quarter note rest here and then continue on over here uh, on B2. I could just arrow key over and then I could just keep on typing whatever notes that I want. Likewise, if I wanted to start typing in notes on Oba 1, I could just arrow key over to wherever the relevant thing is, either just as a single arrow key and that will take me sort of tick by tick, or if I do command left or command right, it will move me over by entire bars. Um, and once I'm in the place I want, again, I can put in the notes that I want. And because as you see, this orange carrot is just a single line, we're only entering pitches for a single thing. However, if I hold down shift and I select multiple lines and I start entering in pitches, Dorico is just going to automatically break up those chords and enter them in on every single line. So that's really useful if you want to just very simply automatically arrange a bunch of stuff into parts very quickly. Um, okay. Uh, and if you have put some stuff in and you want to move where it is, again, you're going to want to pay attention to whether this, uh, whether this uh, carrot is active or not. If that carrot is active, that means that you're going to input something. If you press escape, it's no longer active. Again, notice what's happening over here on this left panel. You see this uh, little button right here, which is the starting or stopping uh, node inputs, right? If I press escape, this button is going to disappear. If I click it, it's going to reappear along with the caret. Um, as with everything, there's a keyboard shortcut for it. So if I find a place where I want to bring the caret in and I just press return, it's going to pop right up. Now, let's say that I put these notes in the wrong place. I can just control, uh, I can just command, drag, highlight them, and I can just shift these things around. So I'm holding down option shift, or sorry, I'm holding down option command arrow key, right arrow, and it's just moving, th moving these notes over according to rhythmic grid. I can move them back this direction in the rhythmic grid as well. There are a lot of really awesome, powerful ways that you can move notes around in Dorico. In addition to moving them, shuffling notes forward and backwards in the bar, you can also lengthen and shorten the durations using, so this is uh, option shift, left arrow, option shift, right arrow. Now, in terms of inputting the rests, um, as I move these notes around in the bar, Dorico is automatically just going to put the relevant rests wherever it is that they need to go. Um, so you don't actually have to, if you're putting in the, if you're putting in your notes, you don't actually have to worry about figuring out the rests. You don't have to worry about figuring out the appropriate durations. Dorico will figure that out for you. Now let's say that you're putting some things in and you want to add a rest. A couple ways to do it. Again, one option number one is just to tick over to wherever it is that you want to be. Let's say that we want to start on beat three here. You can just put in your note and then Dorico will automatically put in the rests for you. Um, another thing that you could do is 
uh, over here, you could tell Dorico manually that you want a rest, which it interprets as a comma. So if you just hit comma and then just uh, type the space bar, you know, it's just going to, it's just going to move you over to wherever it is. It's just going to move you over to wherever it is that you want to be. And as soon as you put in a note, the rests are automatically going to populate. So I'm going to pause right there. What questions do we have about this? Yeah, go ahead, George. I believe you're muted, George. So you want to enter a 16th note at the end of, say, the first beat or whatever. How, how do you, I, I see it's divided into the, the beat and the half beat. What if, what if you want to go in on the quarter beat? Yeah, so if you want to do a 16th note, there are a couple of ways of doing it. So this down right, this little menu down right here is defining what the rhythmic grid is. So currently it's set at eighth note. We could set it to 16th note and you'll see that now the rhythmic grid has all those 16th lines. So that's option number one. Option number two is you could always just enter in a couple of 16th notes and then delete the one that you don't want. Um, and uh, those would probably be, those would probably be my, my first go-to things is either change the rhythmic grid or hijack the rhythmic grid in order to get it to do what you want. Thank you. Yep, sure thing. Good question, George. Uh, is there a way to clear the whole score? Yes. If I were to just command A and press delete, uh, you know, that throws out all of the things that we've typed in. Cool. So multiple voices on one staff. Now over here, um, you know, we've split this out into we split this out into different parts. And so in this particular score, we wouldn't want to have multiple voices on one staff. But let's say that on the piano, for instance, we want to have multiple voices on one staff. So we can go in and we can just type in the different notes that we want. Do, 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 do. And actually, let's type in some. Let's type them in like an octave higher than that, just so that there's some space. So there we have some. Uh, there we have some our upper part. If we want to add our lower part, we just type in shift V. You'll see that there's now a little plus sign with a down stem note right there. Um, that was shift plus V. And now when I start typing in notes over here, um, you'll see that uh, you'll see that the notes automatically just start going in and they're down stem. Dorico is kind of silly in the sense that it gives you an unlimited number of voices. So if you wanted to have like three upstem voices and four downstem voices, you could. I'm not really sure of when that would ever be musically useful, but you can do it. Um, so yeah, that's how you get different stems. Now, let's say that you've decided, oh, I actually don't want these things stemmed this way. If you just press the letter V, it will automatically combine those things together. And you'll notice that it's putting a rest there now because that's showing where the, uh, that's showing where the, um, uh, where the voice comes to an end. And if I do it there, that rest disappears because now it's assuming that the voices are coming to an end here. Sometimes there are situations where, let's delete this one, right? Sometimes there are situations where you don't want this rest there Probably the easiest way to get rid of that rest is to just highlight whatever rest you want and just come up here to edit and then just click remove rests. That's the easiest way to do it. Um, in terms of the back end, what's happening though, if you come down to the properties panel, if you select this first note, um, you'll see that there are these options over here for notes and rest for starts voice or ends voice. If we click on starts voice, that's saying that regardless of where we are in the bar, this note is going to be the thing that starts the voice. And so it's going to get rid of any rests that are happening there. So when you do remove rests, that's actually what's happening in the back end. Is it's show is Dorico is just automatically identifying where should we start and stop that voice. Um, cool. Uh, let's see. So I'm seeing a whole series of questions right now. Philip, can you tell me a little bit more what you mean by removing versus hiding rests within multiple voices? What do you, what do you intend by that? When you're writing for choirs and vo voices and you have multiple parts going on, sometimes depending, like if the, it is in, 
they start out in the unison note and then the alto has to change. You have to insert, like if you're in layer two, you insert a force rest of first quarter note, but then you don't want to see it. You, you, you hide it in finale. So you don't have all this unnecessary. Yeah. Being seen. Like, so are you, is, is Dorico, is, is it like, do you have to hide it or it actually just re it removes it? I don't know if that makes any sense. I I, I don't know if I'm yeah. explaining. So Dorico is not necessarily thinking in those terms. It's thinking in slightly different terms. In, pra okay. so in practical terms, if you just do remove rests, it's hidden. And in practical terms, if for whatever reason you want that rest to come back, you can come over here. You see where that says starts voice. If you unclick that, the rest comes back. Thank you. Yeah, is that helpful? Great. All right, let's see. Um, just skimming over some other some of the other questions. Uh, is there an easy way to go through a passage, repitching the notes in the sequence, keeping the original rhythm? Yeah, there is, uh, Gordon. It's almost like you're an audience plant. Um, it's actually really simple. So let's say that I have this series of pitches and I want to keep the rhythm but change the pitches. I go into uh, I go into note input mode, and then I click on this thing right here, lock duration. That's letter L. Now, whenever you'll notice that when I did that, the carrot instead of being a solid line is now a dashed line. Now, whatever it is that I put in, it's going to keep the rhythms regardless of what that is. Um, Jim, uh, I love your question about the violins thing. Uh, hold off on that for just a moment. I will we'll come back to it. Just remind me if we don't come back to it, Jim, to ask that question again. Uh, Dan says, how do you flip up an octave on note entry? So if we're here and we're here and we're entering notes, uh, once you've entered the note, what you're going to do is you're just going to do command option up or down. So kind of like what you're seeing there at the bottom of my screen is once you've en after you've entered the note, that will give you the option of shifting it up or down. If you've already entered the notes and you realize, you know what, I actually want this an octave up, you can just select the note or an entire passage and then that keyboard shortcut where it's exactly the same. Um, Kathleen says, how do you insert a rest or note into a melody that you've already written? Uh, Kathleen, can you help me understand a little bit more what you have in mind there? Um, yeah, I was just wondering if it was possible, um, if you've written something out and you decide you want two notes to have a rest in between them. So you're basically, it's a question about shifting the rhythm when you've already written, like keeping the pitches. Yeah. But um, inserting a, a, a short silence. So like for instance, um, if uh, in looking at what you've got there, um, where your cursor is, if I wanted to put an eighth note rest in front of the F sharp to turn it into a syncopation, how would I insert something without changing yeah. everything else? Well, there are a couple of different ways that you could do it. So way number one is you could come over here into insert mode, right? Um, and then we could make sure that we have a, uh, we make sure we have a quarter note, or sorry, an eighth note selected. And then we could um, just type any sort of, just any note, and then that just shifts everything over, right? That's, that's way number one. You know, we went into insert mode, we told Dorico that we want to make rests, and then we just typed in any old, you know, really any old note, and then boom, everything shifts over. Okay, so how do I do it without having everything move over? I'd have to turn the the note I'm inserting in front of into an eighth note first. Well, so you so, so let's say that you don't want to move everything over. You just want so like you want this to be an eighth note like this, and then you want it to be like that. Yes, that's what I was asking. Yeah, so so a couple of ways of doing this. First way of doing it right is just changing the note value. Uh, and then shifting the note over. Um, another way of doing it is you could change this note value. Uh, you could dot this, and then you could undot this. Would also have the same effect. Um, there are a couple of other different ways of doing it, but but this is uh, but these are probably the two most straightforward ones. Is that helpful? Great, thank you. All right, awesome. 
Let's see. I, I'm sorry, excuse me, Joseph. Yeah, go ahead. Who's this? Is, is, this is Philip. Okay. Hey, Philip. Well, when you were explaining, you could you could jump the octaves and whatnot. How do you say you decide? Let's see, in measure three, you have the the D E F sharp there, or, or yeah. The, what if I only wanted to go up a fourth? Take them all, or individual notes I want to transpose. Yeah. So there is. So let me introduce. So I've been showing you so far, like some like keyboard shortcut stuff. Um, let me show you the most powerful keyboard shortcut in Dorico, because this is like the, any, if there are any Lord of the Things, Rings fan, this is like the one shortcut to rule them all. Um, so if you press the letter J, this takes you to the jump bar. And the jump bar is awesome because this can get you to any command that you want to be at. Any command, it will take you there. So if I have, if I have these notes that I want to manipulate and I press J, I can just start writing transpose and it will just pop up the transpose menu for me. And then I can go in and you know, I can tell it, okay, I want this, uh, I want this to be a perfect fourth, and I want that to go up, and I have some more options of various different things to do there. I hit okay. Now it's a perfect fourth up. My favorite way of manipulating notes like this is not actually the transpose menu. There is a, another popover. Um, if you come over here, this is you'd find this in the do, 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 do. Uh, I don't even know what it's called. Uh, oh yeah, here it is. Uh, this is the add. It's it's called the add intervals popover, but really this is like a the, this is the transformation popover. Is if you do shift I, there is a whole number of transformations that you can do to these pitches. So again, if we were to come over to the popovers thing. We're going to scroll down to the, uh, go ahead and find the transformation thing, wherever it is that that's hidden. Do, 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 do. Right, here we go. So note tools, I guess it's called. So you can transpose things by an interval. You can add notes. You can invert them. You can reverse them. You can rotate, like all manner of different sort of like motivic manipulations you can all do with this one simple little menu. So for me, typically I don't use the tran I don't go J and do transpose. That's not typically what I do. Typically what I do is I do shift I, and then I tell it T for transpose and then perfect fourth, and it will just transpose it up a fourth. Or let's say again with that menu, um, I, want, uh, I want these to now just be a series of seventh chords. I can type all the intervals that I want above this as separated by commas, three, comma five, comma seven. Now they're all seventh chords. Um, so that one little that one little popover is is quite powerful, and uh, the other ones in Dorico are quite similar in this in the sense that you can do a whole ton of same things with them. Does that answer your question, Philip? Yeah, thanks. Awesome. Cool. Um, is there a way to play with stem direction even with single voice staves? Yes, if you want to override stem direction, if you have a group of notes selected and then you right click on them, uh, it's going to highlight for you all of the relevant things to whatever it is that you have. So you can change the beaming, you can uh, change things about the chord symbols, cross the staves, all the different sort of stuff. What you come down here is you come down here to the stems. And in this particular case, we could say we could force the stem down if we wanted to. Now, if we decide that we don't like that, we can come up here and we can remove the force stem and go from there. I would be cautious, Harris, about um, I would be cautious about playing around with stem direction. Dorico's algorithms for stem direction are very good out of the box, and it even knows such things that say for choral singers, the middle line is typically going to be stem up rather than stem down. So if you're going to if you're going to change the stem direction, uh, you're gonna again. I ju I just caution you because you probably uh, there that might not be exactly what it is that you're after. Okay, I'm just looking over my looking over my outline here. Uh, in terms of tied notes, that's another thing that uh, is going to come up a lot. 
uh, you can do it the basic way, which is, oh, here is an, here is a, uh, here is a quarter note, here is an eighth note. Now I'm just going to come over here and I'm going to tie, that's note that that is a slur, not a tie. I'm going to come over here and tie these notes with the letter T. The thing to know, though, is that Dorico, now that those notes are tied together, Dorico doesn't think of those as two tied notes. Once those are tied together, Dorico is considering the entire duration. So again, if I slide this thing around, Dorico is going to re-spell the rhythm in whatever, in whatever spelling makes sense for where it is landing in the meter. And so one of the consequences of this is if I were to go ahead and start typing in a bunch of half notes, for instance, Dorico is automatically going to just put in whatever ties are necessary to make half notes. Um, you can override the groupings if you want to. If you want to come in and split things up, uh, one of my favorite things uh, that you can do in Dorico is you see these little scissors is you can cut durations up. So if I were to arrow key over to where I want to cut this up, let's say I want to make this D two quarter notes, I can type the letter U and it'll turn it into two quarter notes, or I can just keep on going in the rhythmic grid and I can just keep on slicing this note up into smaller and smaller durations. Likewise, I could do the reverse of it. I could highlight all of these notes and hit T and it's going to just group them all back together and then just respell all the rhythms. So that's, um, that's all of the basic stuff as far as node entry goes. And I've hinted at a little bit of the stuff uh, in terms of things that you can do with these, uh, things that you can do with these popovers. We've already talked a little bit about the meter. Let's talk about, um, uh, let's talk about dynamics because I feel like that's another one that's going to come up a lot. When you're entering dynamics in on Dorico, again, of course, you can always just come in here and just sort of enter in your dynamics um, you know, however it is that you want to do that. Um, uh, George, in terms of how I'm drag sliding these notes around, that's just, uh, I'm just doing option right arrow or option left arrow. That's how you're doing it. Um, option right, option left. I believe you can actually also just click and drag, but I, again, I rarely click and drag things because the keyboard shortcuts are good. So, Let's go over here and we'll talk about adding dynamics. The, again, you can just click things in, but you're better off if you're putting in dynamics just by typing shift D and then just typing in whatever dynamics you want. So let's say that I want this to be piano. I can type in piano and it will put it in like that. Let's say that I want all of these to be piano. I can select all of them, do shift D, type P, boom. Now they're all piano. Let's say that I want this all to be piano going to a forte. I can select the range of notes that I want to have happen. I can type shift D for dynamics, type P, um, less than or greater. I can remember whether that's left or greater than, but wherever, you know, the appropriate carrot as a crescendo going to an F. And now we have P as a carrot going to an F. That's awesome. Yeah. The other thing too, is that these dynamics, you see how they're all blue with each other. This means that they're linked. And so if I drag these around, it's going to drag all of them together such that they're consistently aligned with each other. Um, if I wanted to have, say, the oboe dynamic to not be aligned, what I'd have to do is I'd have to go in and select that one and delete all of those things manually. If I were to only delete one of them, it would assume that I'm just changing the stack. Um, so if you want to delete just if you want to delete just the oboe line, you'd have to filter these dynamics out. Press delete, and then you could go in and you could put in whatever dynamics it is that you want for the oboe. Excuse me, Joseph. Yeah, good. So you have all these dynamics attached. How do we know which staff? Like, what if how, like if I want to manipulate and like make the forte a little higher or the diminuendo? Like, how do I know it's not attached? to the staff below, like when you, when you, when you, um, when you go to the actual part, when you, um, go, oh gosh, go to the linked part or whatever, whatever yeah. the, it's called for this. Yeah. Well, to begin with, if you, whatever you, it is that you've highlighted, right. Dorico is intelligent about where it attaches stuff. It's not going to, if you tell it, I want to attach dynamics to these four notes, it's going to attach it to the relevant staff. If you're not sure about it, if you come over here to engrave mode, 
um, you'll, you can see that there are attachment lines that are attached to all of the dynamics. And you can see that, yeah, this is true, well and truly attached to that particular staff. We're gonna to get to engrave mode a little bit more in the moment, but in, in answer to your question, Philip, um, that's how you can confirm that, yes, this is 100% attached to the staff I want it to be attached to. Thanks. Now, another thing that you'll notice too, is that if we do that in grave mode, um, I can drag this around. You'll note that the attachment position is not changing at all. It's like, I can put this in a comically ridiculous place over here. And from Dorico's perspective, that's still attached to the downbeat of this bar over here. Now, let's say that I made some poor life choices and did that and then regretted my decisions. Um, if you come down here to the pan properties panel, you'll see that you can, there's this start offset. If you just unclick that, it's gonna put it right back to whatever the default position is. Part of the reason that Dorico makes this distinction between, hey, let's, you know, only, we can only edit the position uh, is that we're not gonna move the attachment. Whereas if we were over here, um, you'll notice that if I shift this around, that attachment line is actually moving now for the forte, um, is that Dorico wants to make a clear wall of separation that we're in, when we are in write mode, we are adding or deleting things. When we're in grave mode, nothing can be deleted in engrave mode. You cannot delete anything in engrave mode. And so this is ni nice just to make sure that if you are you know, tweaking, well, where does this dynamic go or where does that thing go? If you're in engrave mode, you're not gonna accidentally delete something. You're not accidentally going to move a pitch. You know, If I try and drag this pitch up or down in engrave mode, nothing's happening. Whereas if I come back to write mode and I drag this pitch up or down, now I can actually move it. So having that separation between engrave mode and write mode is really kind of your safety, such that you don't accidentally change things that you don't want to change. Um, cool. So um, we talked about dynamics, we talked about the jump bar. All right, this, uh, this, is actually a really good, um, this is actually a really good transition into some of these appearance-based things. So we talked about this difference between write mode and engrave mode and how in write mode, this is us adding or deleting things. Whereas in grave mode, we're simply changing the, we're simply changing the visual appearance of things. That's all that you can do in engrave mode is you can just change the visual appearance. Um, another thing that I will point out to you, and this is a thing that you can do in both write and engrave mode, is that you see that you can set properties locally or you can set them globally. So if you're setting properties locally, that means that this is only affecting the layout that we're in right now. So we're in this full score. And if, because we've been changing this locally, if we were to hop over to the, if we were to hop over to the oboe two part, come up here, these are all of your different, uh, all of your different layouts. What you'll notice is that none of those none of those changes to the dynamics are reflected in the Ogo 2 part because we were just changing all of those things locally. Now let's say that we did want to change that globally. If we were to hop back over to uh, hop back over to here, we just toggle this to globally. And now if we shoot the forte right in the middle of the staff there, if we hop back to the Ogo 2 part, we're going to see that the forte is right in the middle of the staff right where we put it. Again, nothing is ever permanent. If you decide you regret your choices, you can just come back to the properties panel, unclick that thing, and it'll go back to being wherever it is that you want it to be. The main thing takeaway that I want to give to you of engrave mode is that in both uh, Finale and Sibelius, and you, well, really all of the other notation programs, there's this sense that, oh, if I want to change something, I'll just go in and I'll just manually tweak every little thing. Dorico isn't designed around that philosophy. Dorico is designed around the philosophy that if you're going to change something, it's better to change it once across the entire score than it is to change it every single little time. So for instance, let's hop back to our full score. Let's say that we don't like the, staffing, the, the spacing of the staves on this particular page. If in engrave mode, if we come over here, you'll see that there are several different options. This one is the graphic editing typically of pitches and dynamics. This deals with the frames. This one's staff spacing and this one's note spacing. 
If you didn't like the spacing of the staves over here, you could come in here and you could edit it manually. Let's say that you wanted more space between the, you wanted more space between the different instrumental sections. You could just come in here and you could just tweak them to get them to be to your liking. That is an option. And um, as you can see right here, uh, the, all of the, everything, every handle that I have changed is red. And if I just click on whatever handle I've changed and I press delete, it's going to go back to whatever the Dorico default setting is on this. But instead of manually tweaking things, what you're better off doing is you're better off going into up here into the library menu and changing things across the entire score. You have engraving options, you have notation options, and you have layout options. These three things uh, that are three options that are helping you get your music set up the way that you want it to be set up. Um, why Dorico splits these things up into three different panels? Uh, let me try and explain that a little bit. So um, layout options, when you open that up over here, you're presented with a menu that looks like this. Layout options has to do with how does your music look when it is on a physical piece of paper. So when your music is on a physical piece of paper, layout options is the one that lets you tweak how it is that that looks. And so you, if you come over here on the right side, you can just change how it is that you want the full score to look. You can come here and you can change how you want the parts to look or you can even just do the full score in the parts if you want all of them to be different. You'll notice, for instance, that the parts are currently set up as letter here on page size and as tabloid on here. So again, you can change these things together, you can change them independently. But layout options has to do with, these are notations on a physical piece of paper. If you come over to the um, notation options, this no longer has to do with notes on physical paper paper, but it has to do with like big picture stuff about how it is that you want your music to appear. So for instance, do you want common practice accidentals? Do you want second B&E school accidentals? How do you want your beams to be grouped together? Um, so for instance, in three, four, you can route across beats or you can turn off the cross beats, whether you break a uh, triplet at, uh, whether you break the B in a triplet or whether you join the B in a triplet, all these different things are here. One of the things I love about Dorico is that it visually shows you what it is that it's doing. And so as long as you know roughly what category of thing that you're looking for, let's say that you're looking for note grouping, you can just sort of skim down and find the picture that has what you want. And you can be like, oh yeah, I want it to look like that. And then you can just click on the thing that looks like what you want and hit apply and then Dorico will, will redo it such that it matches what you want. So the last layer of things, um, uh, so if this notation option is, this is no longer attached to a particular page, this is sort of like bigger picture stuff, um, is the engraving options. And this is where it gets really nitpicky. Um, so for instance, how it is that you stack your accidentals, or how it is that you position the beams uh, above the staff. Uh, somebody asked a question about chord symbols. You can get really deep into the weeds of chord symbols here in terms of how it is that you set them up, of like whether you want the root to be standard or whether you want it to be Nashville, or whether you want, um, you know, how it is that you want major or minor to appear, where it's like either none, or let's do major with the triangle, or let's do uh, minor triads with the minus. You can go and you can tweak all of the appearance of your chord symbols here for all various different kinds of chord qualities and polychords and this and that and the other. So when it comes time for you to tweak the appearance of things, your first stop should be engraving options. Um, your next stop, if you can't find what you need in engraving options, is you can come over to the, again, the notation options. And then if you know for specifically that you want to change things, how they look on the physical page, you would come in here to the layout options and the layout options would, um, the layout options would uh, change whatever it is on the physical page. So I'm going to pause here and open it up for more questions about some of this more like engraving layouty sort of stuff. So, 
Um, I already see some questions here in the chat, so I'm just going to start with Seth and Ray's questions. Can you talk some more about flows? Yeah, let's talk more about flows. So a flow is kind of an abstraction. Um, a flow <clears throat> doesn't necessarily is, it's essentially like this is all of your music, but it isn't necessarily attached to a page unless you want it to be. So let's make a couple of more flows and this will make a little bit more sense of how this works. Uh, a very easy way of thinking about flows is thinking about in terms of movements. So let's pretend that this is, let's pretend that this is movement one, this is movement two, and this is movement three. So for instance, one way of thinking about flows is if we're thinking about these as different movements and we're like, well, gee, in movement two, we don't have the choir, the choir all sits out. And so if I have movement two selected here, I'm over in setup mode and I untick the soprano, alto, tenor, bass, you'll see that those staves are disappearing from, you see that these staves are disappearing from this flow because they're no longer part of the flow. If I go to the soprano part, what you're gonna see is that there's just a big tacit where that second flow is going to go. To make that a little bit more obvious, Dorico can label the flows for you. So I'm just gonna select all right here and just say that, yes, we want flow headings for all flows. Now, if we look over here, you'll see movement one, it's written out with the staff and it's tacit. Here, movement two, it's just simply not in the thing and it's written as tacit. And then movement three is, you know, we just haven't written that in yet. Um, so Seth, what, what other questions do you have about flows? That was it, okay, cool, awesome. So Ray asks, how do you move one dynamic without moving the others when they are linked? Uh, Ray, are you thinking more in terms of like visually moving the dynamic? Or what is it that you have in mind? Yeah, just visually moving it up without moving everything. Yeah. So let's hop back over here, right? Let's say that, you know, I have this this stack of dynamics um, and, you know, I want to move this hairpin because it's a little bit in the way. So we could come over here into engrave mode and we could just select the relevant dynamics. I'm just holding down command. And then um, if you just, uh, oh, this is, it does look like it's, shuffling everything doesn't it Every, everything moves and I, I just want it yeah i want it individually yeah so if you were to if you're to un come back in here and you're to unlink these things or to uh you know if you're to move that from the group okay now when we go ahead and shuffle that along because it's no longer part of the group uh, you're not gonna have any problems okay great thanks yep Let's see. Is it possible to have graphic score notation for a contemporary score? Yeah, very possible. That's let's save that for a Q&A, Martin or Maria. A uh, reminder on how to organize uh, earlier, how to organize instruments. Uh, Jessica, I'm not sure what the question was there. Um, so if you can, yeah. Yeah, ahead. Some, someone earlier had asked the question of if you could go back over how to um, organize the, fl the flute uh, the flautist with the piccolo underneath and all that at the very, very beginning when, when we first started. Yeah, so when you're in setup mode over here, um, underneath, if you toggle any one of these players, right, underneath them, it just shows you what instruments that they're currently assigned. And so most of these, most of these players are currently only assigned one instrument. However, these flute players are assigned multiple instruments. If I decide that I want my doubling for the flutes to be different, I'm like, no, my flute two players only need to be my doubler. I can just click on this instrument and I can, I can just click on this instrument and I can just drag it to flute two. And now the ocarina is the provenance of, of flute two. Now, currently in right mode, what we're seeing is that, um, you know, we're only seeing flute two stuff. And it's like, well, how do we put in stuff for the ocarina and piccolo? This is that distinction that I was showing you earlier between uh, page view and galley view. So if we're over in right view and we come over to galley view, what you'll see is that, okay, here's flute two, but now we also have the piccolo and the ocarina. So I could take whatever I wanted from flute two. I could select it. I could copy paste it. 
you'll notice that once I pasted that into Piccolo, it automatically put that an octave down because it's preserving the sounding pitch. So if we want that an octave up, we'll have to knock that up an octave. Uh, let's say that uh, we want to give this poor player a chance to switch between the ocarina and the piccolo. So we're just going to cut this and we're going to just paste it down here in the ocarina. So we can shuffle around all of the things that we want because we see all of these staves here in the galley view. Once we go back to right view, uh, or sorry, once we go back to page view, you'll see that we're now starting off on Piccolo and it's identifying, okay, once we get to here, this is the Ocarina. There are a number of, uh, there are a number of more things that you can do, in, uh, presumably in engrave mode, uh, where you can, for instrument changes, you can tell it how it is that you want the instrument changes to appear. Um, I'm guessing that it's either in, uh, I'm guessing it's over here. The point is, is that you can, oh yeah, here we go, cool, instrument changes. So you can, so here in the full score, we are hiding the change label warning because that's not a thing in the full score. Whereas if we were to hop over into the player score, because that's so short, I'm guessing we're not having that either, but you'll see that things are just naturally, things are just automatically getting labeled such that the player can, um, you know, do the things that they need to do. So, um, I'm going to just skip over several different questions just for the sake of time. Um, the last one I'm going to we're going to talk about right now is just the lyrics because I think that that's uh, worth uh, covering while we have some time. So if we're putting in the lyrics in, uh, let's putting let's put some music here into uh, into Dorico, just you know something pretty basic. Um, Sure, something like that. Now we can go ahead and we can put in lyrics. So, uh, as with most as with most things, there is a uh, there is a uh, either a panel or a popover you can do. For this one specifically, in order to get to lyrics, you're going to need to go to the lyrics popover, and that you get to that instead of having the panel or, or instead of having the like the little like painter's palette right there, you go to like the popovers thing. And if you click on this, it will bring up the lyrics popover and you can just start typing whatever it is that you want. If you want to put these lyrics into everything, you can highlight these notes. I'm going to go to the jump bar and I'm going to filter lyrics. So there is my lyrics that I am copying. And now I'm going to select all the other parts. I'm just going to paste them into the other parts. In terms of very basic lyric stuff, that is your basic lyric stuff. Um, cool. Is that helpful, Philip? Well, yes, but then now obviously you can see that it's it's clashing with the 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 various um, staves and notes. How do you adjust lyrics either <clears throat> per staff or for an entire? page like on one page you might need to have the lyric a little higher depending on or lower depending on where the note is and it's on one from one page to the next you have to uh, yeah. adjust that stuff well so here in this particular situation i think that the staff size is, is the thing to blame here right i mean we have a uh, we're currently sitting on in the full score we're currently sitting on a tabloid size thing but uh we're you know we're using 19.8 uh, thing. Let me put that into let me put that into uh, inches or millimeters, such that um, such that's a little bit more meaningful number for <clears throat> all of us. Um, I'm in North America, so I'm going to just arbitrarily do inches. So we, that, I just went in order to change the, those units. I just went into preferences and I just changed the unit of measurement. Now, if I come back over to here, it's telling us. Yeah, you know, our staff size is, you know, two point is 0.28 inches. We can very easily go down to a rastral size seven. And for a tabloid size page, that's very comfy. And so now, look, all of a sudden, no more issue. And so one of the one of the very first things that I'd go to is if I'm in that situation, I would ask myself the question: does my staff need to be as big as it is? Because sometimes, or am I on the wrong paper size? Because sometimes that is going to solve the issue just from the get-go. 
Well, that's great and everything, but let's say, you know, the, you know, the alto line's dropping down to G and it's going to clash with a lyric, mm -hmm. the text. Like, how do you drag? Oh, it, that, it, you, you'll okay. see that I keep on moving this and Dorico takes care of that for you. Oh, okay. So you don't have to drag the text around. Yeah. Okay. Dorico is automatically going to try and keep the text in a place that makes sense. And this goes back to the layout options, right? If we go over here to the vertical spacing, you have all of these different vertical spacing things uh, that you can go in and make sure that they're set up in such a way that you just don't have problems. So for instance, if we wanted to change the space between uh, the space, space between staff groups, I could change this to a comically large number, like say 20. And what you'll notice is that, you know, the staff spacing, particularly if, yeah, you'll see how like all of a sudden we now have this comically large space there. Uh, as you can go in and you can change a lot of these spacing things. And that is typically what it is that you want to do is rather than, uh, rather than like manually dragging things around, you want to go into the layout options or the engraving options or that sort of thing, get it right here first, because that way you won't have to make 50 million different tweaks you can make one tweak and then everything else will be fine. Great. Thank you. I do have to say, I mean, you're obviously a pro at this and I, I, I'm, I don't know how everybody else feels. You know, I've been using Finale for 26 years and like you just do things instinctually without even thinking about it. And it's like my brain is hurting trying to relearn like a whole new system here. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, there will be a lot of brain hurt. So like I, I switched to Dorico from Sibelius and it took me about, uh, it took me about a month or two to have like the basics feel comfortable. And it took me about six to 12 months to start really getting fluid. This is just the nature of shifting tools. You know, like any single one of us, if we talked to our students and when their students asked us, hey, how long is it gonna take me to learn trumpet? You know, we, none of us would, and if they thought that they could learn it in like a week or two, like that's silly. Fortunately, the learning curve on Dorico is faster than the learning curve on learning an instrument. So I'm not saying buckle up, it's gonna take you three years to learn Dorico. That's not what I'm saying. But there's a certain amount of just embracing the suck that needs to happen um, when, we're, when we're shifting tools. And I'm hoping that this workshop is helpful in giving you an idea of what's possible and give you an idea of what to look for. Unfortunately, I can't, I, I just can't stop the suck. It's gonna happen. It will be, you, your brain is gonna be stretched in ways for another few weeks or another few months until you wrap your head around how it's working. Thanks. Yeah, no, thanks for bringing it up. All right. Hello. So, um, in terms of hyphenated lines, that's another one I saw out of the corner of my eye, and then we really need to move on. So we can hyphenate, right? Um, you can uh, uh, just oh, whatever. I'm just put a. I'm just going to put in a hyphenated word. So it doesn't make any grammatical sense, but again, hyphenated lines. It's going to put the hyphen wherever it is that it needs to do. Does it do the same thing with dynamic markings and other markings? Yes, yes, it does. So for instance, let's put in some dynamics in the alto part. Uh, let's again, go piano to forte. It's just gonna make space for it. You don't have to worry about dragging staves along to make space for it. Dorica will automatically make space for all of the different things that need to go there. And then once it's made space, if you decide that for instance, oh, I want this actually to be tucked a little bit closer, your first thing that you're going to do is you're going to come over here to the you're going to come over here to the layout options and you know find the um, minimum space with the content. Let's say maybe we want to turn that down to half a space or a quarter of a space, and then hit apply. And you'll notice that you know now that's tucked a little bit more closely. But if you need to manually tweak just one thing, then you can manually tweak one thing and go from there. So for the sake of time, I want to make sure we talk about importing, uh, importing stuff into uh, from Finale into Dorico. So we're going to shift over to that. Um, all of these questions that you're asking are all fantastic, and hopefully we'll have a little bit of time at the end to address them. 
So what I have for you here um, are three finale scores from uh, from proposers that decided they just you know were wanting to show me or just you know have some stuff to to demo things on. So the first one, if we open it up in finale, it looks something like this. Here's our finale score. Not necessarily the cleanest score, but I actually think what's going to happen here is really cool with what happens. So here's our finale score. In order to export that and import into, into Dorico, all you do is you go file, you go export, just hit music XML. Uh, whether you do compressed or uncompressed really doesn't make a difference. Compressed is totally fine. Hit save. And then finale does its thing. And then if you hop over to here, you now have an XML thing. Something that I need to point out here in Dorico, um, it's not the score we're looking at right now, is that if you come over here to Dorico preferences, there are a whole number of preferences that you can set up for how it is that Dorico is going to copy over the score. Now you may think to yourself, gee, I want Dorico to copy over everything that I have in my score. But again, because the way that Dorico calculates things and the way that Dorico is automatically trying to set up your score to make it as little tweaks as possible to have the maximum impact, you actually don't, if, like the most of these things that you can get away with not clicking, you're actually better off because that means that Dorico is automatically going to apply its algorithms to space, to properly space and put in your different things. So one of the things that I always like to turn off here, uh, and most of you can probably get away with, is turning off the beam groups. You don't really need that turned on. Likewise, stem directions, you're probably going to be safe uh, with that turned off. Um, you can go in and you can mess around with various of these different things. But if you just, you know, go th just be aware that you have all these settings at your command of how it is that Dorico is going to parse your music XML file. So once you have it how you like it, you can hit apply, hit close, and now we can go over to this file and um, we can just open this with Dorico and it will open it right up. So the open file looks like this. Um, most uh, music XML files, once you open them into Finale, they're gonna need a few little changes. One of the major differences between Finale and Dorico is that in Dorico, when we're talking about page margins, nothing exists outside of the page margins, nothing. And so if it's a margin, it's a nothing goes there. Whereas in Finale, you can put stuff on the outside of the page margins. And so you're going to often find situations where the margins that you put in are now a little bit too scrunched. So to fix that, again, what you're gonna do is you're just going to go to library layout options. You're gonna come over here. Um, another thing it looks like we wanna change too is for some reason this was imported as a quarto size. We're just gonna change this to letter and then we're gonna come in here to our margins and we're just gonna set all of our margins at, uh, we're just gonna set them all at half an inch because that's how I'm arbitrarily deciding to do it. So once we do that, all of a sudden, the, the music looks a lot better. We still have an issue with the bracketing. For whatever reason, it's not bracketing fully right here. If you need to change the bracketing, this is actually the one thing that you can do in, um, in grave mode. And so you just come over here to the bracket. You just click on the relevant bracket and oops, just go over here, click on the relevant bracket. There's going to be a handle right there, and you can just drag it to the instruments that you want and it will just rewrite it for, you know, as you can see, all of the brackets are now re-bracketed. Now, another issue as I go through and I look at this score, right, is I notice that like the, the casting off isn't consistent, is that we have some pages where we have, uh, some pages where we have three systems, we have other pages where we have two systems, and some of these three system pages are, you know, a little bit too tight. This is another one of these things where if we come into the layout options, we can get it to be consistent for the entire score. So over here in page, uh, and uh, I think it's actually, it's one of these, I think it's staves and systems. Yep, so under here under staves and systems, you're gonna move over here to casting off. And you can set it up 
to have a fixed number of bars per system. This is really helpful if you're doing Hollywood uh, style copying. You can also have it set up to have a fixed number of systems per frame. And so we're gonna set it up such that we have two systems per frame and we're not gonna scale the number of systems by frame height. So once we have two systems per frame, we're gonna hit apply. And now boom, we very consistently have two systems per frame. This is really nice. Instead of having to go in and manually put in a bunch of page breaks and manually put in frame breaks and manually dragging around the staves, just a couple of quicks and Dorico puts in everything for how it is that you want it to be, right? Excuse me, Joseph. Yeah, go ahead. So you assigned globally, I guess, you know, four measures per, per staff. What happens in staff number five? I really want to take that last measure and put it down and like moving, you know, one measure to the next system and whatnot, or up, or if I want to take two measures and move them down just to, yeah, for visual. Well, just for clarity's sake, I didn't change the, I didn't actually change the number of bars per system. I changed the number of systems per frame. Oh, okay, f yeah. fine. But, if, but, if, same, but same point, right? Let's say that like over here, right? I want to move this around. I believe the keyboard shortcuts are actually identical, is that if I do period, this will shift it over to the next frame. Um, and if I do comma, this will shift it over to the previous frame. Okay. Um, another thing that you'll notice as well is you'll see these colored bands on the side. This is telling you how tightly spaced the frame is. This is actually a very useful thing just to have a sense for, well, how much music is on the page. So it's telling you this is how tight the system is. This down here is telling you how full the page is. Um, and so that can give you a sense when you're trying to like manually shift around the casting off of like, is this too tight? Is this too loose? Say for instance, that we were to, um, let's, put in a, let's put in a system break here and shift this over to the next system. When it's purple, that's your signal that, yeah, this, this system is probably too loose. So, uh, does that help? Well, uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, no, I appreciate all the great questions that you're asking. It's very helpful for me as a, as a presenter. Sorry, Joseph, um, you, yeah. what is a frame? I'm familiar with uh, measures or bars, systems, and pages. Is a frame a page, or is that something different? Yeah, so Dorico thinks of things, so in terms of frames, right? Dorico is set up like Adobe InDesign or Affinity Publisher or like a desktop publishing program, right? Where it has frames where content lives in. So like this box right here is a frame that, yeah, this box contains music. Uh, these green boxes are frames that contain text. We can also create frames that are, um, uh, we can also create frames that end up being pink and these will create, gra will contain graphics. So if I double click on this and I, you know, try and find some, you know, banal photo, I can just go in and I can put a graphic uh, within a frame there in, uh, within a frame there in Dorico. So, that's how it's set up. Is it's set up like a it's set up like a um, it's it's set up like a desktop publishing program. And if I wanted to change the size of the frame, you know, I can go ahead and I can change the size of the frame. And you'll notice as I'm doing that, because I changed page one, that now has a little red carrot at the top. And now it's, since I changed page two, that has a little red carrot. If I right click on that and then remove all page overrides, it's just going to go back to whatever the frame is. Is that helpful explaining what a frame is? Yes, thank you so much. Great, perfect. Um, awesome. So let's do just a tiny yeah. bit more on this one. And then there's another file I want to look at. And then we will look at, uh, we'll look at, uh, uh, we will look at, uh, we'll open it up for questions and answers. So you'll notice that you know, so Michael had set up his score, Diverging Confluences, Movement 3, Presto, and he had his name and that sort of stuff there. And that's not popping up here. Um, in Finale, uh, you can go to, uh, you can go to the file info and the file info, I forget exactly where that is, um, you know, has all kinds of, has all kinds of things you can put in for like the title and the subtitle and this and that. Dorico has that same sort of thing. If you go over here to project info, 
And you can have info, not just for the project, you can also have info for every single flow. And so by default, Dorico takes whatever info you had for in your finale file, finale file and dumps that into the flow. But we can very easily just take that and we can copy that info into the project. So we just come down here, copy info from uh, you know, this particular flow, hit copy. You'll see that it's now all populated. Once I hit apply, now we have the actual name of the piece and we have uh, the composer and so on and so forth. Now, a couple of more things that I'd want to do is I'd want mm -hmm. to change the, uh, I'd want to go in and I'd want to change the name of this flow is that this, this particular movement is actually not called diverging confluences. This particular movement is called Presto. So we can come in here, we can rename this Presto and now it's Presto. Uh, unfortunately, it's currently set up as number one. Presumably, if we were to you know, have the entire thing in here and we were to move this over to its appropriate position as flow three, now this is three, presto, right? If we had the appropriate number of, num the appropriate number of flows for movements, this would be set up as presto. So that's kind of all that I'm going to say for now. I'm presumably there are going to be more questions on this thing. Uh, on you know pulling stuff in from music XML. So I'm going to pull in a different file. This one actually doesn't have a lot that needs to be done. I think the main my main takeaway that I thought was really cool for this one is that with just a few tweaks, a lot of the page layout and the spacing and this and that and the other, like it ended up actually being cleaner in Dorico than it was in Finale. I mean Finale it's just you know not the cleanest of scores, but over here Dorico just recalculated and reset up everything. Sometimes for you, that might happen. Keyword is sometimes. Other times that might not happen. And so I wanna show you an example of, other, of another situation where it was a little bit more complicated. And I'm gonna show you two things. So let's say first that you, instead of importing all of these, instead of converting all these files all at once, you want to convert these files from music XML to, or from, from Finale version to music XML quickly. You come over here into Finale, go File, um, Export. You'll see there's an option over here of Translate Folder to Music XML. And so you click on that, you select whatever folder that you want, hit Open. And it will warn you that if there are any XML files currently in there, it will overwrite them. And so we'll just say, yeah, that's fine. Now what it's gonna do is it's going to go through the process of creating these things. And kind of as you saw earlier, um, uh, it has to open up the file and it has to do a bunch of manipulations to it in order to do that. And so you're seeing in real time uh, kind of what it's taking in order to make that happen. So if you have thousands and thousands of files to convert, um, my unfortunate news for you is it's gonna take a while. Probably it's the kind of thing where it's like, set it up, go grab a cup of coffee and go watch next Netflix for an hour or something. <laughs> but it's just gonna take a while to copy over some of these things. Once that's done, however, you'll have a folder that has all of your, that has all of your files in it. And this is another one that I wanted to uh, look at and import. So again, this is what it looks like in Finale. And this is what it's going to look like in, uh, in Dorico once we open it. So again, we have a similar sort of thing that's happening where we have this extra flow heading that we don't want. If we hop over into the layout options, come down under flows, we can tell it to not show flow headings and that flow heading will go away. Uh, if we scroll around through this, again, it looks like we have, uh, we have a few casting off issues. And so again, I'm gonna go back to the layout options and I'm just gonna tweak some of these details until it gets to be the way that I want it. I don't want this to be quarto, I want that to be letter. And I'm also going to uh, again, arbitrarily overwrite it such that we just have a fixed two systems per page because that's pretty sensible for an orchestra piece. So now we have our piece that's set up like this. We again, various things that we can do so that we don't have this orphan system back there, but that's beyond the scope of what we're doing right now. There's uh, one major thing that I wanted to show how to do here. So the composer of this piece has several sections in this piece where they are have these 
uh, where they have these ad lib harmonic glissandi, and they're doing them at various different rates. Unfortunately, if we were to pop over, so this is bar 57 onward. If we were to hop over to bar 57 over here in Dorico, um, we can just scroll over or we can just tell there is a command where we can just hop to bar 57 and it'll take us right there. What you'll notice is that at bar 57, uh, which is right here, that those things didn't translate over. There's just something about how it is that Dorico is understanding uh, these glissando lines slash how the composer input them and how it is that they're set up that just didn't match up. So what I want to do is I want to very quickly show you two different ways that this composer could put these lines in there. First thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to delete that uh, glissando line just because it's uh, it's not these aren't helpful. I'm delete that one. I'm going to delete this one. Um, hop back over to bar fifty seven. So there are two ways to do this. Option number one of ways to do this is that you can enter this in using, uh, using Dorico's lines panel. This is, a, this is a pretty easy way to do it. So these are just simply horizontal or vertical lines. And so what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna just create uh, the carrot just so that Dorico has an idea of where I wanna create a thing. And I'm going to click in uh, that I want a horizontal line. Um, which I don't know why that's not, uh, here we go. So yeah, cool, horizontal line, great. Now, obviously this horizontal line isn't exactly the, the duration that I want it to be or the distance. And so I'm taking this, uh, you can either with a keyboard shortcut or with your mouse, you can drag this forward or back and I'm just making it roughly the duration that I want it to be. And then in the engrave mode, I'm just going to move this line such that it looks like how I want it to look. Now, because these are attached to a particular place in the, they're attached to a particular place in the staff, I can just press R. Um, and this is one, another one of my favorite shortcuts in Dorico is that any arbitrary selection, if you just highlight it and press the letter R, it will just repeat whatever that thing is. And so whether that's notes, or you can do that with text markings, or dynamics, you can, uh, anytime that you press letter R, I'll just repeat stuff. So as a result of pressing letter R, I now have two lines in here. And so now I'm just gonna set it up such that visually, such that visually this looks the way that I want it to. Just again, in engrave mode, setting this up the way that I want. Once that looks the way that I want, I can now select both of these things and I can just press the letter R and it's going to uh, populate appropriately. Now. I'm going to need to shift these over into the staff. But it's pretty easy just to highlight them all and shift them over. So if I were the composer wanting to do that, that's one way that I would do it. Another way that I would do it um, also has to do with uh, also has to do with putting in lines. Is you can create your own arbitrary lines here in Dorico, and so if in this line palette, what we can do is we can come over here and we can click this little edit button. And we're gonna create a new line. Uh, we're going to create it, we're gonna call it harmonic gliss. We're gonna tell it what kind of line body that we want. We have a whole selection of various different line bodies that we want, or we can go in and we can create our own very specific thing. Um, so we're going to make our own, using repeatable symbols, we're going to make our own special line body. We're going to call this one random gliss. We're going to put in um, just, you know, whatever symbols it is that we want for that. We're going to tell that we want it to repeat the pattern. Now this is looking appropriately random. We're going to hit OK. We're going to come back here into the body style. We're going to find our random gliss, which is there at the bottom. We're going to tell this that we want this inside the staff and then hit OK. Now we have now up here this new line that we have and we can just go ahead and we can arbitrarily make this line whatever distance it is that we need to fill the glissandi thing. So 
there's more, obviously more that we can do to manipulate this line and to change it around to various sizes and other things. I just want to show you what's possible, not necessarily show you how to do every nitpicky little thing to do this. Excuse me, Joseph. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, it's Philip again. Um, no, you're, you're being star pupil by actually being the one to add, unmute and ask questions. So thank you. <laughs> so you have your score in here now. Does Dorico <laughs> automatically generate linked parts? So now can you look at violin one, two, violin, you know, all of those now? Or do you have, is there some weird? Yeah, so if I come over it? here, boom, there's violin one. Now we are going to have to do some things to, again, fiddle with that because Dorico, the, the way that it was set up in Finale is kind of different than how it's set up in Dorico. So we're going to have to fiddle with that. But whatever the case, we do have linked parts. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Dumb question. Is there a reason why when you went to the viola part, it kind of went a different color on the page? Is there a re like, yeah. is that a that's to help, that's to help, that's like your visual cue to know that you're looking at a part rather than a score. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, and so uh, a similar sort of thing happens when you're going from right mode, right mode into engraved mode. Uh, so if we were back at the score, right? Here's the score in right mode. Here's mm -hmm. the score. Um, well, I guess it does. I guess it's not making that distinction, but in engraved mode, it is definitely getting those margins. Cool. Thanks. Yep. All right. So. Um, we're a little bit behind time-wise in terms of where it was I wanted to be, but we did at this point cover essentially everything that I wanted to cover as a starting point. And so I've given you a whole bunch of thoughts. And so I want to open it up, open up the floor right now for the next 17 minutes, just to ask whatever questions it is that you want to ask. Jim, thank you for the remind. Uh, we'll start with your question. Is there an easy way to enter four notes on a violin line then split them to violin one and two with the first and second note on violin one and second fourth on violin two. And then is there an easy way to split the stems uh, up and down bottom on the staff? Um, yeah, let, I'll just take your directions, Jim, and we'll go one at a time through them. So we're gonna not save this. Uh, we're not gonna save this file. We're just gonna make something new. So if I are doing what you're talking about, Jim, so we're gonna come over here. We're gonna make a string orchestra piece. So first thing that you and I'm going to put in a I'm going to put in a um, time signature just for simplicity's sake. I'm going to call this four four, and we'll give us uh, we'll give us three more bars. So the first thing that uh, you're asking about, Jim, is there an easy way to enter four notes and on a violin one? Yeah. So if I'm here in uh, if I'm here in write mode in writing notes. The easiest way to do that is, of course, just play it in on a MIDI keyboard. On a MIDI keyboard, you know, you can put in as many notes as you want, and you know, Dorico will uh, put those notes in. Let's say that you don't have access to a MIDI keyboard. You can still put in multiple notes. So if I put in that first note, uh, if you come over here, there is this chord tool. If you click on that for chords, now it's going to keep on adding notes to. Um, uh, now it's just going to keep on adding notes to whatever is on the. Uh, whatever is on the right side of that line. And it's just going to keep on adding them until either I arrow key over, you know, or I move out of note mode. So whether with a, whether with a, um, uh, whether with a MIDI keyboard or on a computer keyboard, you can add multiple notes. So here are our multiple notes, right? And so then you want to split the first and third note on violin one and second and fourth notes on violin two. Um, the, I mean, that is a little bit arbitrary. What I would probably, let's say that we have a series of chords and then I, I think that that will sh uh, you know, really, uh, really uh, show. And I'm just gonna put in random chords. I mean, these aren't well voice led, but they'll do the trick. So what I can do here, if I want the second and fourth of these lines to be below and the third and um, and the first and third above, what I can do is there are keyboard shortcuts, or I can just go here filter. Uh, I can filter the second note or single notes. Great. So I'm going to filter that second note or single note. I'm going to cut that. I'm going to paste it over here. Likewise, I can come over here and I'm going to filter the bottom note. I'm going to cut that. 
going to click over here and I'm just going to type reduce and that's going to signal to Dorico that we want to add those notes into that part. Now, meanwhile, in terms of changing the voice, um, currently we can't press V because we don't have another voice. But if we do shift V, now those are all stemmed down. Likewise, over here, we can filter the bottom voice. There's currently, I can't press, I'm currently pressing V and because there is no downstem voice right now, it won't go in there. But if we do shift V, it will put those all into a downstem voice. All right, so that takes us up to the middle of what you're talking about, Jim. Also, if you already included it, already have a key change included and you want to change the entire piece up, is there a way to transpose the entire tune at once with all uh, mods at once, or do you have to transpose the key in section at the same time? Um, you can transpose everything all at once. Um, so, and you can have even transpose the chord symbols as well. So we can have Dorico say, generate these chord symbols from the notes and selection. Um, and it, again, sophisticated things, we're not gonna worry about that. So we have Dorico, it's generated the chord symbols. What I can now do is I can highlight all of this and I can transpose this again, shift I, we're gonna transpose this, let's say up a minor third, and it's now transposed everything all together. So uh, Jim, I is that everything? I will let you answer that in the chat, Jim. For the sake of time, I'll keep on uh, looking through questions. So Kevin says, is there anything special to note about exporting music XML from Dorico? Um, the short answer is not that I know of, but there might be. Um, for contemporary music harmonics and microtones. Okay, so for harmonics, um, oops. So for harmonics, how it is that Dorico deals with this, it's great that we have a string orchestra here. Just you know, pick any arbitrary note. You're gonna come down here to the properties panel and you're gonna tick on the harmonics. Now you can, by default, it's gonna do the artificial harmonic. If you come down here to the partial, you can tell it which partial you want the artificial harmonic to be on. Dorico is intelligent and it knows what your options are for each string. So that's for artificial. If you set up natural harmonics, um, it's going to give you the little circle. And like all things Dorico, if you decide you don't want that to be a harmonic, you just turn it off. So that's that. In terms of microtones, um, this is something that I hardly do anything but with, but it does do it. So what you can do is you can tell it uh, that you want a particularly ton particular tonality system. These are the ones that are built into it. Um, but you can also create your own tonality system, which is not something I have experience with. Um, but um, once you put in the relevant key signature for that equal tempered uh, you know, thing with the tonality system, then you can go in and you can add whatever sort of microtonal uh, notation you want with that. And if you decide that you wanna switch from the Gould arrows to the Steins in them, presumably, you know, you can fairly easily do that as well. Cool. Lyrics questions. Could you demonstrate how to enter a melisma? Yeah, uh, that's pretty straightforward. So we're just gonna put it on a violin just cause this is what's here. Um, and I'm just gonna put the word down. You just press spacebar, and it'll just draw the melisma line for whatever it is that you need. Uh, in Finale, I use a special OTF font for, to create expressions. Can I import that OTF font uh, for the Dorico's equivalent of expressions? Um, presumably you can. I, uh, where you would find a lot of that stuff is you would find that over here in music fonts. Uh, so this is your overall, like your general music font. Let's say that I wanted to have this, you know, it has all of your your finale things. So if I wanted to have this more in like a Broadway type setup, I could do that in music fonts, or I can go to Ash and it will, again, automatically set things up the way that I want. Um, if you go into paragraph styles or character styles, um, you can go in and you can set up uh, 
very specific fonts for whatever it is that it is that you want to set up. Um, that's going to be happening in there. Now, Bill, I know that you want, are looking for specifically harp techniques. I would start off, even before you load that font in, I would start off just by looking in the playback techniques because Dorico has built in, uh, and it's fil filed under pitch percussion, Dorico has built in a number of the harp, harp techniques already. So you might not even need to use a special font. You, you might be good to go just with what Dorico already has supplied in terms of harp stuff. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, microtonal changes on an existing note. Uh, Sandra, I'm honestly not sure, but I'm sure that someone on the Dorico forum would be able to answer you. This would be my time to go around and plug. Here is the forum. There are, uh, as experienced as a Dorico user as I am, there are people who know even more than me about Dorico. If you come over here to this, uh, you could ask that. The other place that I would encourage you to go would be over here to Facebook. Uh, the Dorico group on Facebook is lovely. The, it's a very supportive group and you can typically ask a question and it will be answered you know, within an hour or two. It's very helpful. So that's where I would go. Um, that's where I'd go if I had those sorts of questions. Uh, as I mentioned before, here is the getting started with Dorico handout. I'm going to throw this into the chat. I bring this up because these different forums that I just mentioned are right here, online support forums. And so you have some frequently asked questions for new users. You have this welcome thread for Finale users. But if you click here, this will take you directly to that Dorico forum. And if you click here, that will take you directly to the Facebook group. So. Um, Michael asks, is there any way to type in, say, a verse of lyrics and then add them onto notes similar to Finale's method of click add? Um, I'm not familiar with the click add, but what you can do is you can sort of type in a verse of things in just any sort of text editor. You can copy this and then you can paste that into Dorico. So if I were to um, you know, go ahead and start uh, putting in the, um, uh, just start pasting, right? A verse of lyrics. Now, one thing that Dorico doesn't do yet is it doesn't yet uh, hyphenate stuff for you automatically. This is something that I wouldn't be surprised if they uh, were to add in the future. So for now, uh, when you're, if you're putting in something like this, you just need to be careful every time that you hyphenate stuff. You just need to like backspace. Um, and then when you go to the next note, which it looks like is in this voice, cool, lyrics. You just need to make sure that you put that in there. <clears throat> so let's see, I missed the down with a word extension. Yeah, so like the word extension or melismas, literally all that you do is you just type in the word and then you just hit space and it will just make a little melisma line for you like that. Indicating hard yarn mallets uh, and that sort of stuff. So again, a lot of this stuff is going to exist over here. If it's missing from what you have over here, you can come over in here to, um, these playing techniques and you can create your own. So you can go hard, yarn, mallet. Um, and then you can come over here and tell it that you don't want this to be a text, you want it to be a glyph. And you can come over and find whatever glyph it is that you want. Uh, Dorico has all of the glyphs, literally all of them. And so it's arranged not my favorite way. It's arranged sort of like in terms of how door, and it's arranged in terms of how it's set up in the Smuffle font. But if you scroll down here, you will find eventually, but you will find, uh, so here are some more harp techniques. Here are tuned mallet percussion pictograms. Um, so here are all of your pictograms for tuned mallet percussion. Um, eventually, yeah, beaters pictograms. Boom. So there are all of your beater pictograms. And I don't remember exactly which one it is that you're after, but you can select whatever beater pictogram it is that you want. Let's say arbitrarily it's this one. Uh, we can add the glyph. 
Um, we can delete this one, delete that one, click OK, boom, there's our glyph. The popover text is hard to ML it. OK, good. Now you see that that's there in our unpitched percussion, and then there is our hard to ML it or whatever sort of mallet it was that I selected. But yes, you can add that in. Uh, is that helpful, Glenn? I know I went through that really fast, but there is going to be a replay that I'll send this to you and you know that it's at least possible. Um, yes, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, Harris asks, the melismas aren't generated automatically. Uh, it's actually the opposite, Harris. The melismas are generated automatically, is that if I just put in a word, it assumes that I don't want a melisma there. But if I just hit space, it's just going to keep on creating a melisma for however long I tell it to create a melisma for. Um, uh, Harris, if you want to unmute yourself, just let me know if that, OK, yeah, that that is, yeah, OK, cool. You're good to go. I'm sorry, Joseph, the, the melisma, the word extension, mm -hmm. if you would put slur, if you would slur those two, all those notes, would it then automatically put that word extension in? Because you sort of had to force that extension in. Yeah, no, if I if I just slurred all these notes, um, it wouldn't it wouldn't automatically put that extension in. No. Oh, OK. Yeah. So you can slur it and then you can do that. Maybe in some future version of Dorico that will happen, but for now you need to do those two things separately. Mm -hmm. um, hi, uh, Christos is, if there's some more time, could you please wait to do polymeters and different polytonalities and in different instruments? Um, polymeters is fairly straightforward. And it's also something I, I remember how to do polytonalities. I don't remember how to do off the top of my head. So what you can do when you enter in a time signature, the normal thing for that is just shift M. But if I do option shift M, uh, or when I'm entering in a, or, why isn't this letting me do this? If you, if you type the, if you type the popover dialog a little bit differently, which I'm not sure why it's not letting me I'm not sure why it's not letting me do that. Um, it will give you the option to, um, it will give you the option to apply it. Oh, I think I know how it is that you do it. Yeah, okay. I remember I was doing it backwards. So if you do shift M, you can type in whatever the, you know, your normal time signature. Instead of pressing, instead of pressing enter, uh, you want to do option enter, and then it will rewrite that one line uh, it will relight that one line for whatever it is that you want. So here is six eight over four four, and the and the bars are going for whatever you want. If I were to delete that, it will just pop back over to four four, which is the one for the entire system. All right. So unfortunately, I'm out of time for now. Again, if you have if you have further questions for me and you want to keep the conversation going, as I mentioned, um, uh, feel free to schedule a time to chat with me here uh, over in the Dorco audit. And this, that can just be a continuation of the questions and answers. I might do another session like this that's just entirely question and answers in the future. So if that's something that you want, please just shoot me an email and we'll schedule another time and we'll just be Dorico questions and answers. So anyway, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for your fabulous questions. And I look forward to chatting with you in the future. Take care, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Yep, sure thing. <laughs>